are killing people. There is no vaccine for climate change, but we do have solutions. Last year, WHO published our manifesto for a healthy and green recovery, calling on all governments to protect nature, support clean energy sources, develop sustainable food systems and healthier cities, and reduce polluting activities. Together, the six prescriptions of the WHO manifesto can not only restore resilient economies, they are a linchpin and essential prerequisite for healthy societies. At the COP26, at the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow this year, WHO will deliver a special report with recommendations on how to maximize the health benefits of tackling climate change while avoiding the worst health impacts of the climate crisis. WHO is also spearheading an initiative on promoting climate resilient health systems in collaboration with the government of the United Kingdom. Today, it's my honor to welcome someone who needs no introduction. Over the past few years, Greta Thunberg has become the powerful voice of a younger generation demanding climate action. Greta's mobilization of communities, particularly young people, has been truly inspirational and has brought into sharp focus the impact of the climate crisis on people's lives and the urgent need for transformative action. The awareness she has raised on the links between climate, the environment, and health has supported WHO's agenda in these areas, demonstrated the threats all of us face, and the role young people can play in building a more sustainable, safer, healthier world. More recently, she has become a powerful advocate for vaccine equity. Taksamike Greta. Today, Greta has announced a donation of 100,000 euros from the Greta Thunberg Foundation to the WHO Foundation in support of COVAX to provide vaccines to people in need. Greta, thank you, Taksomike, for your superb advocacy for climate action and now for vaccine equity. Your contribution makes the first and the youngest person to contribute to COVAX. Welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you so much for, for having me. It is an honor to participate in this event and I will, yeah, I will talk briefly now. And science shows that in the future we will most likely experience mo more frequent and more devastating pandemics unless we drastically change the way, our ways and the way we treat nature. Today, up to 75% of all emerging diseases come from animals. And as we are cutting down forests and destroying habitats, we are creating the ideal conditions for diseases to spill over from one animal to another and then to us. And we can no longer separate the health crisis from the ecological crisis. And we cannot separate, separate the ecological crisis from the climate crisis. It's all interlinked in many ways. And during this pandemic, we have seen what we can achieve when we put resources into science. Vaccines were developed in record time. But so far, on average, one in four people in high-income countries have received a coronavirus vaccine, compared with just one in over 500 in low- and middle-income countries. And the international community, governments and vaccine developers must step up their game and address the tragedy that is vaccine inequity. We have the tools we need to correct this great imbalance that exists around the world today in the fight against COVID-19. 
just with the climate crisis, those who are the most vulnerable need to be prioritized, and global problems require global solutions. It is completely unethical that high-income countries are now vaccinating young and healthy people if that happens at the expense of people in risk groups and on the front lines in low- and middle-income countries. And this is a moral test. We talk today about showing solidarity, and yet vaccine nationalism its what's running the vaccine distribution. It is only when it really comes down to it that we show our true face. And that is why I and many others are supporting WHO, Gavi, and all involved in the COVAX initiative, which I believe offers the best path forward to ensure a more equitable global vaccine distribution and a way out of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greta. And thank you for your generosity in donating to the WHO Foundation in support of COVAX these funds will help us save lives. Around the world, young people have been affected by the pandemic in many ways, from disruptions in education, loss of employment opportunities, mental health challenges, and increased domestic and gender-based violence. WHO is committed to ensuring that the global recovery from COVID-19 includes the voices energy, and ideas of young people. To do that, we have partnered with an alliance of the six largest youth development organizations in the world to form the global youth mobilization to empower young people to respond to the challenges created by the pandemic in their local communities. The global youth mobilization has established a grant mechanism with funds from the Solidarity Response Fund to support innovative local solutions to address the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. From today, young people around the world will be able to apply for grants of between 500 and 5,000 US dollars through the global youth mobilization. These local solutions will be judged and decided on by young people for young people. To mark the starting point for young people to get involved in the global youth mobilization, a global youth summit will be held virtually from this Friday to Sunday, the 23rd to the 25th of April. Over three days, thousands of young people leaders, policy makers, and change makers will come together in one space to discuss the issues facing young people across the world. On behalf of the big six youth organizations, the United Nations Foundation and WHO, I invite everyone to join us at the Global Youth Summit. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by representatives from two of the big six organizations. First, it's my honor to welcome Elahi Raushan, a volunteer with the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies in Bangladesh. Elahi, thank you for joining us today. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tedros, for inviting me here today. I'm really honored to be here. My name is Ilahi Roshan. I'm a Red Cross Red Crescent Youth Volunteer living in Bangladesh. There are about 3 million young people around the world who have been taking action to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, driving the response efforts and supporting their local communities. I would like to share with you my story to help explain why recognizing, championing, and investing in young people through the global youth mobilization is important. I led the very first disinfection team of Bangladesh Red Crescent Society in different hospitals for two consecutive months. At the beginning of the pandemic here, the hospitals needed more supporting hands, and we wanted to make sure 
the hospital environments are safe for everyone. And we did to a great extent. Like one day, when the very first COVID patient died in a hospital, and everyone was so frightened to go near him, even his own son was reluctant to take his father's body. We went in, we disinfected the room, and made sure the body is safe for carrying. Another day, I carried a critical COVID patient on a wheelchair, put oxygen mask on her when there was no one around for the support of, of that person. But I was not the only one. There are thousands of young people in Bangladesh fighting this battle in many different forms. About 4,500 young volunteers of the Red Crescent Society supporting the vaccination program every day in Bangladesh. It's mostly the young people here who are making a difference. And again, it's the young people here who are mostly affected by the pandemic. Many of my friends, colleagues from the different youth organizations and networks have lost their jobs. Almost everyone here is suffering from mental health issues. The data shows that from March 2020 to February 2021, more than 14,000 people have committed suicide, which is 45% higher than the previous year, and majority of them are young people. My dear friends, I have seen localized action making a positive impact on people's life during this pandemic. I have been trying to collaborate with the Red Crescent Society with my workplace BRAC, who have been offering skills program, online skills program for the young people. Now, both as both parties have agreed, the Red Crescent Youth Volunteers will receive a three month online skills training on different traits like graphics designing, web development, etc. I believe Drives like this will help young people individually and at the same time, it will contribute to the national economy. There are plenty of organizations and individuals out there who are making many more new initiatives to combat this COVID crisis. And I would like to invite them all to collaborate with the global youth mobilization and it will support, promote, and invest in your initiatives for improving more lives and communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elahi. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Daisy Moran, a representative of the World YMCA and a board member of the Global Youth Mobilization. Daisy, thank you for joining us, and you have the floor. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, Dr. Tedros, and greetings to you all. I'm Daisy Moran, proud to be with the YMCA in Illinois, USA, and proud to be one of the six youth board representatives of the Global Youth Mobilization. Here's what youth mobilization has meant for me as the COVID pandemic has significantly increased the inequities in all of our societies. As a young leader, I saw a need in my community to offer relief to essential workers who are undocumented immigrants. Through collaboration with fellow young changemakers and organizations, we were able to, almost, to disperse almost $17,000 in relief funds for 38 families. This is just one of thousands of stories that illustrate the simple and powerful fact when given access and opportunities, young people can make a significant difference. In the YMCA and right across the big six youth organizations, young people have stepped up during the pandemic by delivering supplies to vulnerable people, looking after each other's mental health, making masks, helping share vital public information, and now actively facilitating the COVID vaccine campaign. As the global pandemic enters the recovery and relief period, it is crystal clear that young people are disproportionately impacted by the immediate and long-term implications of disruption in education, employment opportunities, physical and mental health well-being, to name a few. These two reasons, young people bearing the brunt of impact of COVID, young people offering so many of the solutions, 
are what has inspired the big six youth organizations, the World Health Organization, and the United Nations Foundation to support young people around the world in delivering and developing youth-led community solutions through the global youth mobilization. I am so excited and I want young people all over the world to be excited and get involved. They can start by attending the Global Youth Summit, which will be held virtually from the 23rd to the 25th of April. At the summit, they will hear about the role of young people in the immediate and long-term COVID recovery. It's a great forum where we can share our thoughts, passions, ideas that will influence policies and decisions that impact all of our lives. This is a critical time for my generation, for our generation, to bring policymakers, change makers, advocates together to address the major challenges confronting young people, find solutions, and put them into action in our communities. No matter how big or how small, I encourage you to have the confidence to apply for funding. If you have an idea to chat, if you have an idea to a challenge created by the pandemic, you can apply for funding from $500 to $5,000. It is young people like you and me that will evaluate and agree who gets support for these local solutions. So please visit our website, www.globalyouthmobilization.org. We are the movement by youth for youth, and young people really are the answer. We are not the challenge. We are truly being the change that we want to see in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daisy. By youth for youth. And thank you to both of you for your leadership and, and vision. I look forward to joining both of you at the World Youth Summit. And I look forward to seeing what ideas we can help take forward through the global youth mobilization. This is a reminder that although we are all living through a dark time, there are also many reasons for hope and optimism about the future. Christian, back to you. Thank you very much, all, and thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. We will start the rounds of questions and answers. To remind you, um, if you want to get into the queue for questions, please press the raise your hand icon on your screen. And we'll start with the first question from Carlos from El Mundo. And Carlos, please unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Go ahead, please. <laughs> you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a question specifically for, for Greta. Um, is, um, is, is, isn't there a risk that the COP26 could lose the, the momentum? And um, what should we really change in the next three uh, months, for example, to, to change, to turn the tide and, and to, to put the two goals of uh, climate change and vaccination equality at the same level? Thank you very much, Carlos. And yes, Greta Thunberg, please. Yes. Um, I mean, of course, there's a risk that that COP will lose momentum. But the most important thing is that everyone is safe. And of course, safety and health comes first in these kinds of situation. Um, so, and of course, there, there's not just one thing that needs to change in order to, to break this, this trend that we are seeing now. There's not just one single thing that we can do to so-called solve the climate crisis and the vaccine inequity crisis. Uh, of course, it's it's much, a bit more complicated than that. Um, and I think I may not be the, the best person to answer that. I think there are lots of experts that are more, more uh, suited for that question. But we do need to change our mindsets. We do need to, to think globally and not only think for ourselves, about ourselves. Um, that's what these crises come down to, that we only think for ourselves, that we don't think about others. They come down to the way we treat others, the way we treat other human beings, the way we treat other animals and nature itself. So we need to change our mindsets. If, if you want one simple thing, it's, much, it's more complicated that, than that, but if just one thing. Thank you very much, Krita. And I'll ask Dr. Marianera from WHO to add, possibly. 
Thank you, Christian, and thank you very much, Greta. It's, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, you are an inspiration. You have been driving an incredible movement, and uh, many people is behind, so certainly the COP26 has to be something very successful. In response to your question, uh, Carlos, Ola, uh, I think uh, what will change the mindset and what might have an incredible impact is what uh, our Director General was saying at the beginning, the health argument of climate change. If we are able to explain people that climate change is about our health, is affecting our health, and if we stop to burn fossil fuels, the benefits will be enormous in terms of reducing the causes of climate change, but as well on reducing air pollution. And air pollution, as mentioned again by the Director General, is responsible for more than seven premature million deaths every year due to exposure to air pollution. And in addition to that, it creates an environment that makes our health more vulnerable and create the perfect conditions for more emerging infectious diseases to occur. So I think we have a perfect case here for creating more action at the, at the COP26, giving the health benefits that can be obtained in an incredible way if we tackle the causes of air pollution, if we tackle the causes of climate change, that will be an enormous health agenda. And, and talking about health is what can make this uh, change that we all need in terms of ambition to, to, to go for more at the COP and in convincing people. If we go, if we tell people that this is connected to the human health, I think this will be the, the, the final argument that will create much more motivation and engagement and probably a stronger movement uh, uh, to put political pressure on those who will take decisions and hopefully going for much more. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was Dr. Maria Nera, um, Director for Environment, Climate Change and Health. The next question goes to Shoko Koyama from NHK. Shoko, please unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead, please. Thank you for taking my question. So regarding the COVAX, uh, UNICEF is trying to buy 1 billion syringes by the end of this year in order to distribute countries together with vaccines. Um, 1 billion syringes in addition to 6 to 800 million syringes. Um, uh, they procure annually seems to be a large quantity. Um, is COVAX able to procure this huge number of syringes by the end of the year? And what challenges there are regarding the procurement of syringes? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shoko. And I'll give to Dr. Bruce Elwin. Thank you very much, Shoko, for the question, and thanks for highlighting that it takes more to get the world vaccinated than simply to make and, uh, and, and procure the vaccines, because there are all the additional pieces that have to go into this, including additional supplies, like not just syringes that you mentioned, but also the vaccination cold chains and other supplies that are necessary to keep them in the right conditions before we get them to the actual uh, uh, people who need to be vaccinated. In terms of the syringes, uh, just like the, um, the cold chain equipment, the COVAX facility began working with countries way back in October, even earlier last year, to look at what numbers of syringes would be required and to start working with manufacturers to ensure that pipeline would be there. You might remember some months ago, the Director General invited Henrietta Four, who is the, uh, who is the uh, head, the Executive Director of UNICEF, to, uh, to join one of these press conferences and at that time, she explained what they were already doing uh, to try and make sure that the necessary syringes would be in place. Now, this will continue to be a challenge, just like all of the supplies necessary to get the world vaccinated, these extraordinary numbers. But uh, for the moment, the pipelines are there and the producers are doing their part. But, uh, you know, it all comes back again also to the COVAX facility having the resources it needs so that it can put the contracts in place up front to make sure or the supplies are there, not just the supplies in terms of the vaccines, but exactly like you highlight, the uh, syringes and the other supplies, uh, including, as I mentioned, the cold chain equipment and sometimes very specialized cold chain equipment to get these products to people. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Elwood. And we'll move on to Robin Millard from AFP. Robin, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, a question for Greta, if I may. Um, if vaccine inequity carries on and young people start being offered a vaccine in wealthy countries, whilst at the same time elderly, vulnerable people remain completely unprotected in poor countries, would you advocate a vaccine strike amongst younger people in rich countries until their government starts sharing more vaccines? Thank you. Thank you very much, Roma. And of course, Greta, the floor is yours. Yes, we must not forget that this is not a problem that is caused by individuals. This is a problem that needs to be addressed by the international community, governments, and the vaccine de developers. Um, it is wrong if we should start focusing on individuals and urging individuals to not take the vaccine. That would send the very wrong message. Of course, everyone who, who is offered a vaccine should take it. Uh, but this is, we need to see the bigger picture here and be able to focus on several things at once. So no, I would not advocate for people to not take the vaccine. Thank you so much for that. And we'll move to Jamil Shad from O Estado de Sao Paulo. Jamil, please unmute yourself. Jamil, do you hear us? Please unmute yourself. Can you hear me, Christian? Please go ahead. Jamil? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is Amir Shadi, journalist from Brazil. Uh, Ms. Greta Thunberg, my question is about uh, vaccines, but also on climate change. What is your message to President Bolsonaro at this time when both the pandemic is hitting hard Brazil, but also uh, climate change is an issue? And you all you all know very well what is the position of, of President Bolsonaro. What is the message you can send him today? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamil, and over to Greta. Of course, um, I don't think we should be focusing on talking about individuals since this is a much larger problem. But of course, uh, Jair Bolsonaro has a huge responsibility, both when it comes to the climate environment, and of course, we can see the response that Brazil has had during the corona pandemic. And of course, you can, I think, well, I can only speak for myself, but I can safely say that he has failed to take the responsibility that is necessary to, in order to, to safeguard present and future living conditions for, for humanity. Thank you very much, Greta. And we'll move on to Navas Shah from Xinhua. Navas, please unmute yourself. Navas Shah, do you hear us? Please unmute yourself. No, it looks like we're not getting to you, so then we'll continue with Gunilla van Hal from Svenska Darkblooded. Gunilla, please unmute yourself. Yes, can you hear me? <coughs> Wonderful, go ahead. Thanks a lot. Thanks for taking my question. It is to Greta Thunberg, and I'd like to know your view on the proposal from WHO and, and many governments, among those you, your own, the Swedish government, uh, that richer countries should donate remaining vaccine doses to poorer countries once their own risk groups have been vaccinated and before they vaccinate the rest of the population. What do you think about this, and what do you respond to people questioning this, saying, why should we sacrifice our own populations in order to save uh, the world? Thank you. Thank you, Gunilla. Over to Greta, please. I think uh, that is a very reasonable thing to do. Um, we need to protect the people. We need to protect and prioritize the most vulnerable people in risk groups and working on the front lines, no matter which countries they come from. At least that's my opinion. And uh, of course, I understand that people will be frustrated by that. Um, of course, I also want to return to, to everyday life and everyone I know uh, want to do that as well. But 
but we need to to act in solidarity and we need to use common sense um when it comes to these issues and for that i think that we like i said it's the only sensible thing to do, the only morally right thing to do, is to prioritize the people who are the most vulnerable, um, no matter whether whether they live in a high-income country or a low-income country. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sundweg. And we'll move ahead to Jamie Keaton from AP. Jamie, please unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, thank you, Christian. Um, my question is uh, both for Ms. Thunberg and uh, Ms. Uh, Moran. Um, what is your message to young people who have become a major driver of COVID-19 infections? We heard Dr. Uh, Director General Tedros just mentioned that in increased social mixing among younger adults um, is uh, possibly one of the reasons for the increase um, in infections and hospitalizations among people aged 25 to 59. And if I could just uh, sneak in another question to Ms. Thunberg, um, ahead of President Biden's climate summit, what do you hope it will achieve? Thank you. No small questions today. Thank you very much, Jamie. Let's move to Greta Thunberg first and then uh, on. Thank you. Uh, yes, of course, it's absolutely crucial that everyone takes our personal responsibility in this crisis. If we, we young people may be the, the ones who, who are least affected by, in general, least affected by the virus in a direct way. Uh, but, of course, that, like I said, we need to act in solidarity with the people in risk groups. And, and of course, many young people... Uh, fail to draw that connection, maybe. Um, of course, not everyone, but uh, of course, there will always be some. And my message to those is that we need, during crises like these, we need to, to take a few steps back and act for the greater good of society and in order to protect our fellow citizens and, and, uh, and then, of, of course, p especially people in risk groups, because that is the thing you do during crises. You, you, you step up for, for one another. And my hopes for the Biden summit is, um, I hope that we will start soon, in one way or another, start treating this crisis like a crisis, the climate crisis, that is. Uh, because if, if we are to be blunt, I mean, we can have as many summits as we want. We can have as many meetings and conferences as we want and talk, make nice speeches and nice pledges like net zero 2050 and so on. But as long as we, as long as those things contain so many loopholes as they do, and as long as we are really not, as long as we are not actually treating the crisis like a crisis, of course, we won't be able to achieve any major changes. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, this is something that we need. We need to, to change our mindsets and we need to change our view of the world. We cannot move into this, try to solve this crisis with the same approach that got us into it in the first place. Um, so we need, we need to start treating the crisis like a crisis without um, increased level of awareness uh, among people in general, of course, there will be no pressure on, on the world leaders to actually start making the changes that are necessary to safeguard humanity. Uh, so my hope is that we will start treating the crisis like a crisis. Thank you so much, Greta. And let me first give the floor to Daisy Moran from the Global Youth Mobilization Youth Board. Daisy. Thank you. And thank you for your question. I believe my generation, our generation that we are representing is a generation of allyship because we understand our privilege and how to use our privileges to uplift those in the most vulnerable situations. And the Global Youth Summit is a platform and a forum for all of youth and stakeholders and supporters to come together to really listen to what are the policy changes that need to be made so that we can have more equitable societies and systems in place. 
So I hope that you can join us this weekend while we discuss the important issues and challenges facing our generation and how our youth leaders are in a position to create the most innovative solutions to tackle these big issues. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daisy. And I'll move to Dr. Maria van Kerkhove. Thanks, Christian. And I just wanted to, uh, those were excellent answers, but I did want to clarify something here. Um, with regards to increased transmission, we are seeing increased rates of infection across all age groups. Um, last week, there were 5.2 million cases reported to WHO globally, the largest in a single week since this pandemic began, 16 months into the pandemic. That is the largest increase in a week uh, that we have seen to date. We've seen an increase across all age groups. Um, this uh, virus is not being, we, we shouldn't, we need to take the blame away um, and in the question, it was um, meant to blame, and we can't do that. Everyone has a role to play in this pandemic. We all have a role to play in keeping ourselves and our loved ones safe. What we are seeing is an age shift, a slight age shift in some countries, driven by social mixing. And social mixing doesn't necessarily mean going out and having a party. It means individuals who have to leave their home to go to work. It means individuals who have to feed their families. Um, and if you increase social mixing for a variety of reasons, whether this is for work or whether this is for religious reasons or whether this is for indeed socializing itself, the virus will take advantage of that. If you add on top of it these variants of concern, variants that are circulating around the world, particularly the B117 variant, which is circulating in a large number of countries across the globe, they have increased transmissibility. If you add variants that have increased transmissibility with increased mixing, this virus will take off and case numbers will increase. In a number of countries, we've seen a very, very steep incline due to this. In addition to that, we are seeing some countries um, not able to implement the social, the public health and social measures that are needed to allow for physical distancing. And in many parts of the world, physical distancing is really not possible. Um, but in other parts of the world, it is. So we need to do what we can to avoid those crowded settings, avoid those uh, settings where social mixing, particularly in indoor crowded settings where there's poor ventilation, where the virus really likes to spread efficiently between individuals. Um, we need governments to enable people to carry out those measures. Very easy for us to say stay home if you can, but we need governments to support individuals to work from home, to stay home if necessary, so that we could reduce the possibility of the virus to spread. All of us really have a role to play. Youth, young people, children, young adults um, are showing us ways in which to be innovative, to remain socially connected, yet physically distant. And I think what we are seeing with the youth and this youth mobilization is really energetic. There's a spirit, there's an energy here that is holding leaders accountable and saying, help us help the situation. Uh, and I'm really inspired to see that. I, I was really happy to hear the by youth for youth, as you've pointed out, and showing us that young people uh, young adults, uh, children can make a significant difference every day. So please, let's stop the blame in terms of who is spreading. All of us have a role to play. All of us need to be supported in taking those individual level measures, as well as measures at the family, at the community, at the subnational, at the national, and at the international level. Thanks so much, Dr. Van Kerkhove, and I'll have Dr. Mike Ryan, WHO um, Health Emergencies. Executive Director to Anne. Uh, thanks, Christian. I just want to reflect on <clears throat> one thing that Daisy said. Uh, she said the uh, youth are not the problem. Youth are the solution. And I fundamentally believe in that. Uh, and thank you, Daisy, for saying that. And the energy from, from everyone today is fantastic. Uh, reflecting on something that Greta said, uh, she spoke about mindset. Uh, and mindset is everything and uh, Ted Ross reminds us of that every day I think it's one of his most common uh, pronouncements about mindset and it doesn't matter what problem you're trying to solve there's no amounts of announcements there's no amounts of re there's no amount of recommendations there's no amount of anything that changes anything until we change our mindset and that can be the mindset about protecting ourselves and our families from COVID and taking precautions it can be the mindset on on, on government's response to um, to COVID, it can be the mindset driving climate action uh, and and reducing uh, climate change. So I, I think really, really 
we all need to reflect on that. It is our mindsets that drive our behaviours, both positive and negative, and they're having a huge impact uh, on our planet. And obviously, our behaviour is having a huge impact on the trajectory of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. Next question in line comes from Isabel Sacco from EFE. Isabel, please unmute yourself. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christian. Um, I, I would like to know if you could give us an overview of the proportion of people under 40 uh, years old who are in ICUs globally or, re or in or by regions. And connected to that, uh, what do we know about mortality among babies? I saw figures from Brazil that indicates that uh, 1,300 babies have died there from COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Very detailed questions. Let me give to Dr. Mayoria from Kiako first. Yeah, thanks for, the, thanks for these very important questions. I cannot give you a specific answer of the proportion of those under 40 in ICU, but what I can say um, is that there is an increasing number of hospitalizations among younger individuals. And this is driven by what I answered in the last part of the question was, when you have increased transmissibility across all age groups, you will see increased rates of hospitalization, you will see increased proportion of ICU, and you will see increases in death. Um, and we are seeing, unfortunately, a, a little bit of a shift in the age structure in terms of the, the median age of individuals who are infected, but that is driven by changes in social mix mixing patterns. If you remember, last um, spring, in the Northern Hemisphere spring, we actually saw a similar, uh, similar situation where as societies were opening up across Europe, for example, the age, there was an age shift in the median age. It went from an older age group to a slightly younger age group. Again, this is driven by people who are leaving their homes to go back to work. And if there is the, the virus that is spreading, if you have virus variants, uh, this is a dangerous combination. We are seeing increases in hospitalization among younger age groups and increased ICU and increased deaths. With regards to children, I did see that report um, that you had mentioned about in Brazil. Um, overall, um, if we look at infection among children, if we look at severity among children, still around the world, um, there is a, a lower proportion of children that experience disease, um, that experience severe disease, um, and some children do die. Um, if there is a lot of virus that is circulating, if you have you know, millions of cases that are being reported, and you know so far we've had 140 million cases reported worldwide, we will see deaths in all age groups. Um, with regards to the youngest children, um, overall uh, they tend to be more mild, but again, this is not universal. We do see that children, uh, particularly children with underlying conditions, but, but children in general, have died from COVID. So everyone is at risk from this virus. Um, people are uh, at risk of getting infected, at risk of getting severe disease, so we do need to do what we can, where we can, as much as we can, to first and foremost prevent infections, but also that making sure that we use the systems that are in place to get tested, um, to be able to carry out the public health actions that do prevent the spread um, from an adult to a child, or from a child to an adult everything that we can to really prevent that, that level of infection and care for, for as, as many people as we can, getting them early into that clinical care pathway to receive the care based on the symptoms that they have. Thank you so much. Next question goes to Akwazi Sarpong from BBC News Africa. Akwazi, please unmute yourself. Akwazi, do you hear us? Thank yes, you. please go ahead. Akwazi, the sound is really bad. Please yeah, try one this more time. Yes, go from ahead. Orkin in Ghana. So it's not, I'm not. So this Akwazi is from, from, I have two questions. I would like many young people living with disability, particularly visual impairment, have been affected by this virus in Africa, and at a global level. The second question is that, what programs are in place to support families with children and young persons with disability and special needs to help us combat this? Thank you. Thank you very much, Akwazi. Very important question here. And I'll hand to Dr. Van Kerkhoff for a start. 
I can actually start. Um, in fact, um, we have departments that are working uh, particularly on persons with disabilities to ensure that persons uh, with disabilities who are disproportionately affected by COVID-19 in a variety of ways, whether this is about getting the right care, uh, receiving information um, appropriately so that they know how to keep themselves safe, making sure that they have the ability to um, uh, receive uh, the materials, the needs, uh, the testing, et cetera. We have some guidance that is coming out, um, I, I hope, uh, today. Um, it was approved uh, yesterday, um, looking specifically at the more than one billion people uh, worldwide who are living with disabilities, making sure that they have access to vaccination, for example. Um, we have seen some innovation in terms of personal protective equipment. If, you, if you've noticed some of the masks, for example, will have a clear panel um, so that you can see lips moving uh, for people who um, have a hearing impairment. Um, and so there are a number of innovations that are coming online to support individuals with disabilities, but also families uh, with disabilities as well, because even individuals with disabilities, uh, the, their caretakers have to be able to care for them. So we need to make sure that those caregivers are protected uh, against the virus as well. So there's a number of activities that are underway to ensure those living with disabilities, as well as those caring for disabilities, have the appropriate care information uh, that they need. Thank you very much, Dr. von Kerkhoff. Next question goes to Priti Patnaik from Geneva Health Files. Priti, please unmute yourself. No? Pretty lower hand, apparently, in the meantime, where we don't find you anymore. Then uh, next question goes to John Saracostas from The Lancet. John, please unmute yourself. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me there? Very well. <coughs> Go ahead. Yes. Yes, I was wondering if you could give me uh, up-to-date uh, estimates on how many vaccine facilities worldwide with excess capacity could be enabled to produce vaccines. Uh, and secondly, if it's possible, if Dr. Tedros could give us his perspective on what's going on in his homeland, where right now they're facing an existential threat. Thank you very much. We'll take the first question. Um, and I guess we'll try if uh, Mariangela Simao is online. Or then... I could, I could start. Dr. Like Swaminathan, exactly. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for that uh, question. This is exactly the work that we've started now as part of the COVID uh, vaccine manufacturing task force with our COVAX partners, CEPI, Gavi, UNICEF, as well as the private sector and regional bodies like the African Union, but also regional other regional uh, organizations. The idea really is to take a, a short, a medium term and a longer term approach. The short term and the immediate need is to increase vaccine supplies within the next weeks and months. And that can be done by unblocking uh, roadblocks and obstacles that, are, that have been identified by the manufacturers and by working with suppliers of those critical ingredients and raw materials so that we can link suppliers and, and um, manufacturers, as well as work with member states to make sure that export bans and things like that don't interfere with the process of vaccine manufacturing. So that's our immediate uh, short-term priority, which hopefully will, will be able to put more doses uh, to COVAX for COVAX uh, in the coming weeks. The second more medium term is to look at fill and finish capacity to link us. We know that there's a lot of unused fill and finish capacity globally. And therefore, we need manufacturers who have the capacity to make bulk product and link them with these existing fill and finish uh, capacities in facilities around the world. So CEPI already has uh, done a mapping of that, and it exists. And, and then the third, more medium to longer term, is really to develop um, new facilities or to build on existing facilities, particularly in low and middle income countries, um, and get technology transfer. Encourage companies, as the DG mentioned, the WHO put out a call on Friday, both for owners of technology, particularly mRNA technology to begin with, to come forward to work with us, to share that technology, share the know-how and experience with recipient companies 
that will be selected according to a set of criteria that, that we are developing. And this will ensure not only supplies for this pandemic, uh, though it may take you know, a few months to get this up and running if we start with existing facilities with uh, some expertise, but also will help the future regional health security of regions which currently do not have any manufacturing capacity. And this obviously can be extended to vaccines for many other infectious diseases. So that's what the task force is uh, looking at. And over the coming days, uh, we will provide a much more detail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Swaminathan. And I'm calling for, on Dr. Mike Ryan to take the other part. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, important question. Uh, the situation in, 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 in Tigray, in Ethiopia, uh, remains very, very dire at the moment. Uh, we have, the uh, situation is not improving. We have unpredictable access, increasing humanitarian needs, uh, increasing sexual violence. Uh, the response has been hindered by armed clashes throughout the region, and many areas are still not receiving food or other assistance. Uh, we've got uh, 4.5 million people affected by this uh, crisis. Uh, 2.5 million of them have no access to services whatsoever. To half a million of people have no access to food. Uh, we have a million internally displaced people in 178 sites scattered across the region uh, being serviced uh, uh, by uh, IOM and UNHCR. We've had over 800 uh, cases of uh, sexual and gender-based violence from just five hospitals alone, from reporting from five hospitals alone, uh, that many cases. We've over 62,000 refugees who have crossed into Sudan. But that's, uh, that uh, uh, safety valve is very, very difficult to manage uh, and very difficult uh, for trust to have access from that side and to support people in the affected area. So as I said, unpredictable access, displacement, tremendous humanitarian needs, uh, we, we have 20 health partners working with us who are operational on the ground, but they're only accessing about half of the where it is uh, concerned. And when we look at health facilities, we've done a health facility survey throughout the, the region, 264 health facilities. Uh, as of now, only 72 of those facilities are operational, uh, are operational and, uh, and 40 of those are, are only partially accessible. Uh, 19 hospitals have been completely damaged or destroyed. Uh, 15 more with major damage. Uh, there's inadequate supply chains across the board. So the situation in Tigray could not be more dire. The people there could not be in more need of support and help. Uh, the situation is deteriorating. The situation is very much uh, a massive concern on a purely humanitarian basis here. There is a health crisis on top of a humanitarian crisis. We're very concerned about malnutrition, about malaria, about cholera, measles, COVID-19, Positivity rates have been rising and other diseases like meningitis and other diseases that will exploit malnutrition. They will exploit stress and they will exploit um, uh, uh, all of what's happening in that population. Uh, we have resumed surveillance activities, but only in about uh, covering about 30 percent of the population. Uh, and again, severe acute malnutrition is a major, major issue. It is very hard to overstate the extent of the humanitarian crisis and the health crisis currently unfolding in Tigray. Um, and the WHO and the other uh, UN agencies and, and NGOs are calling for unfettered humanitarian access and for, uh, for, um, for uh, military conflict uh, and those perpetrating that conflict to remove themselves uh, from, human, from, from civilian areas. And those who should not be there should not be there. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director for WHO's Health Emergencies Program. And uh, Dr. Bruce Aylward wanted to come in too. Thanks, Christian. I just wanted to come back to the point, the important point, John, you raised about the additional, how much capacity is unused around the world right now. Because there's a huge uh, attention last week with the conference of the African Union, uh, the co consultation that was called by the World Trade Organization about trying to expand vaccine production globally. But we need to remember that 
the challenge is how we're actually using the doses that are being made. Because last week, while those conferences were taking place, 100 more million more doses of vaccine were administered around the world. And the issue, John, is where they're being administered, because 1% of that 100 million went to low-income countries. So 99 million doses of vaccines last week went into high upper middle income and some low middle income countries, but only 1% of that went to the lowest income countries. So every time we bring new capacities online, when we bring new deals online, et cetera, that you're hearing about, um, we need to ask the question of where those doses are going, because those doses are not going to the places that have got the least vaccine today. So we need to be careful in thinking that we can simply build additional capacity, because that capacity is still going to the wrong places, quite frankly. So while we are giving great attention to how do we expand capacity, it's going to take weeks and months for that to come on online and in the meantime we've got to take some you know urgent and important decisions about how we are going to use the vaccines that exist today because if we have a lot more weeks where a hundred you know 99 percent of the vaccine goes to a set of countries that already have most of the vaccine we are not going to get out of this uh, crisis as rapidly and efficiently and with as least uh, you know lives lost as possible Thank you very much for all your answers. Uh, with this, we're coming to the end of our question and answer session. I was very glad to have you all online today and our special guests. And I will ask actually our special guests to start the closing round and we'll go in reverse order. We'll start with Daisy Moran from the Global Youth Mobilization Youth Board and World YMCA representative. Daisy, please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity once again. And as a reminder, please join us this weekend on April 23rd through the 25th to have your voice heard. Youth have the solutions. Please come to the table. We want you to be involved in your local communities and we have the funds to support you. With any questions, please visit our website at www.youthglobalmobilization.org. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks so much. And now we go to Eli Roshan volunteer from the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Christian Societies and supporting the young people in Bangladesh. Elahi, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone for inviting me here. And I would like to echo my uh, last voice, young people are the solution. And I would like to uh, invite all the localized solutions to uh, collaborate with the global youth mobilization who have been supporting these local actions and promoting them. So I would also like to invite everyone to join the Global Youth Summit coming up this week from 23rd to 25th. Thank you once again. And thank you so much, Elahi, to you. Um, and last but not least, we go to Greta Thunberg, climate and environmental activist. Greta, floor is yours. Well, to be honest, I don't really have anything more to add. Just take care, everyone. And, uh, well, yeah. Um, but also, when, when we have media here, I really urge you to really bring awareness to this issue of vaccine inequity, because you have the power to, to raise awareness about this. And when we... When we talk about like um, countries like, for example, the UK and the US, just as a few examples, that they are mass vaccinating large groups of their populations, even healthy and young people, that we that we see it from from a different perspective, that we don't only see it from our Western privileged point of view, but rather that we think globally and. We need to prioritize those most vulnerable first. Uh, thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Greta, for these words. And uh, yes, uh, there's hardly anything to add. I agree. From my side, let me thank everyone and uh, remind you that the, uh, the, the sound files of this press briefing will be shared right afterwards uh, today. And the transcript will be available as of tomorrow. Dr. Tedros. Thank you, thank you, Christian. So I would like to thank our guests today, to Greta, Elahi, and Daisy.
you have been wonderful. Thank you so much indeed. And I would also like uh, to join you in uh, inviting everybody to join the 23rd to 25th Global Youth uh, Summit from Friday to uh, Sunday. Uh, so look forward to seeing you there. Uh, and I would like also like to I would also like to thank our um, media colleagues who have uh, joined and uh, see you in our upcoming uh, presser that will be on uh, Friday. So thank you, thank you so much.